Welcome everyone to Rock M Radio. Uh, this is a brand new episode of Dive Cuts. We've been here for seven seasons. And of course, we're here to talk about your Missouri basketball tigers. I am your host, Sam Snelling. Uh, with me on your right, if you're watching us on YouTube, is Matt Watkins, aka at Data Mizzou. Uh, if you are not following him on Twitter, do so. If you're not subscribed to this YouTube channel, please do so. Uh, you can hit the like button below. Uh, there's also a subscribe button right next to it. Please hit both, um, unless you're unless it says unsubscribe and don't do that. Um, so. Watkins, the last time that uh, you were on the pod, we were coming off a loss. Uh, so what better way to have you on the podcast than by facing another loss? Uh, actually, were you on? It was a couple weeks ago. They they were coming off a win, right? Um, we had a Wichita State in the middle. But yes, I was on right after uh, Jackson after State. Jackson State, State, yeah. So uh, Harris shies away from those. He doesn't have yeah, the, he, uh, he, he, I think he's. I think he's a little. He's a little bit chicken. Is is what it is. is uh, he he was on last week after Kansas, but only because Mizzou got a commitment several days later, so he felt safe coming back on. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, it's 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 like there for the highs, not there for the lows. He is not <laughs> not a true son, uh, unlike the two of us who are here through thick and thin, right? Um, you know it, and it's been a little thin. So it was a little thin on on uh, Sunday. It's it's Tuesday, it's December nineteenth. I realize like the rest of the Mizzou media world is talking about football and the transfer portal and recruiting and the Cotton Bowl and all these good things happening. Uh, and we're gonna sit here. We're gonna talk about Mizzou going to Kansas City and basically looking uh, pretty bad uh, for for most of the game. They did kind of put together a run there to make it a little closer. Uh, but never fully threatened uh, Seton Hall in the second half. Uh, you know, once Seton Hall kind of got their 19-point lead. Um, it's disappointing. It's another sort of disappointing trip to Kansas City. Uh, so, Watkins, in your opinion, why do they keep going back there? Well, <clears throat> I guess that's a good question. You know, I'm I'm fighting upstream in this battle. I I really really don't like neutral side games in general. Um, You know, if you follow me on Twitter, you've definitely seen me very skeptical of why teams go to half empty arenas to play other big name teams when you have these palaces built on campus for the purpose of hosting great basketball games. Um, I think it was just this weekend when there was the four team event down in Atlanta and I shared a screenshot of Ohio State, and I believe it was UCLA playing in front of about 10 people. I mean, these are two big-name programs, the biggest, I wouldn't say in basketball, but the biggest names in college athletics. Um, and they're playing in Atlanta, of all places, um, in front of no one. And I, I just, I, you know, there's always this conversation about, you know, could college basketball be better? Is it slipping? Whatever. I'm like, why don't we put these games in front of huge fan bases? We we saw Kansas go to Indiana, and the place was wild. You know, even yeah. last week, Mizzou went, went to Kansas. I don't enjoy going to Kansas, but I can't deny that when those two play each other at a neutral or at a at each other's gym, it's a, it's a huge event, and that's the case anytime a big name comes to it comes to the comes to campus. So. You know, that aside, I, you know, Mizzou playing Seton Hall in Kansas City isn't exactly a big draw. Um, you know, I think they said they was, had like 7,000 fans, which I'm not yeah. sure. Like, like I think you, you play Arkansas Pine Bluff and get more people in the, in the door than, than 7,000. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of get it that we, we have a game every year in St. Louis, but I almost, you know, that is a neutral site game, but it's kind of an institution. It's, you know, it doesn't move around. It's been played one time, I believe, since the mid to late 80s outside of St. Louis, and that was during COVID. Um, Right. You know, as a St. Louis resident, it's it's something on the sports calendar here, even if you're not really involved in either school, which obviously I am, but... It's something people talk about. It's something people get up about. Um, but yeah, but I don't know. Also, like, you, you grew up on the west side of the state too, so like you're not exactly like you know like born and bred. You know, grew up going to Bragging Rights. 
Um, I did not go to high school here, which perhaps is most important. <laughs> <laughs> Guilty. Uh, yeah. Um, but, you know, like as, you know, as somebody who, who did grow up here <clears throat> and, and grew up in St. Louis, uh, you know, I, I do think it's it's really one of the few times a year when, you know, like even when when Mizzou basketball is down, which has been, you know, a lot over mm-hmm. like the last, you know, 25 years or whatever. Um, not, you know, maybe not a lot, maybe it's being unfair, but, but more than we would care to admit, uh, you know, the, the Bragg and rights game is still a huge draw. It, it like, mm-hmm. even in Kim Anderson's years and, you know, like that was Kim Anderson versus like John gross and both programs are kind of struggling. You know, like it's still going to get that place 80% full. It's going to be a great atmosphere. Like it's going to be loud when, when one of the teams goes on a run, Um, you know, so if you make something like that, and like, I think this is also, uh, and I realize we're getting off Seton Hall, but I think this (laughs) is it. it, I do feel like it's an important topic. Uh, You know, if, if Mizzou and Kansas played in Kansas city every year, uh, and just said, you know, in perpetuity, we're going to play this game in Kansas City. Uh, like, I I feel like it would become kind of like that and, and very quickly where, where you know, people would, you know, make sure that it's whatever the date is, is marked on their calendar. But I would much rather, like, have the game in Fog and, and Mizzou Arena and, and actually play those types of games in those types of environments. Um I was actually, you know, the second you brought up neutral court, my first thought was UCLA and mm-hmm. Ohio State because, like, whatever you want to say, like, UCLA is the biggest brand in West Coast college basketball. Ohio State is probably one of the three or four best brands in the Big Ten, which is a great basketball conference. Um, and for, like, those two teams to, like, play each other in, in Atlanta, <laughs> you know, like... I almost like don't even mind. So like Baylor played Michigan state Detroit. Mm -hmm. I don't love that. Like I'd rather they just go to Michigan state, go to East Lansing and, and, and play that game. Um, but that's, that's better than like, what are you doing in Atlanta? Like, I mean, if you're a UCLA fan, are you really wanting to fly to Atlanta to watch your team play? Like, uh, you know, and I've been to Atlanta. I like Atlanta. It's, it's a, it's a lovely city. Um, you know, but a mid-December trip to Atlanta just doesn't really seem like something that, you know, jumps off the page. So I'm with you. Like, I just, <laughs> I, I know like Chip Kelly, uh, I think got uh, you know, a lot of sort of virtual pats in the back for his little rant and how to fix college football. And I think some of the, the truths that he speaks about college football also could translate to basketball. And that I, I think you need a central scheduling body and mm-hmm. you need somebody who's just going to take the softness that coaches have for home gates and wins and for neutral site games that won't hurt them in their NCAA tournament resume right. uh, and just take those out of their hands because that's the reason why we have all these MTEs. I do think MTE should, should exist but we need to probably cut it in at least half and it needs to be organized by like conference and like, they need to be like good teams. Like if you won your conference last year, you get to go to an MTE or something like that. You know what I mean? Like I'm convinced enough. some of those are money laundering operations. Yeah. <laughs> right. You're yeah. just trying to take a loss to, to write some money. Off the books. I mean, you watch these places and it's like, they're smaller than, I mean, I went to a high school that had 50 kids in a class and we had bigger crowds than some of these yeah. games. You're just like, what? I mean, what are we doing here? We, You have a good product and you're just taking this far away from the people who care about it as possible and pricing everyone else out. Like, why, why well, are we doing yeah. that? And I understand going to, like, to Maui. I understand going to the Bahamas. Like these are all like even like Charleston is kind of like a cool like MT venue, but then like I mean, are we really gonna do like Disney World? I'm sorry, <laughs> like, uh, like as somebody who like I I went to why what is the Wide World of Sports, uh, mm-hmm. which is like their big venue down there for like a Cardinals Braves uh, spring training game. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know, I 
I lived for, I think a couple of years in the, like the St. Petersburg area and, and, uh, each spring would watch the Cardinals in spring training. Cause it's, it's like, honestly, like if all baseball was like spring training baseball, like I would probably be a lot more into it where it's just like, there's like 1500 people in the stands <laughs> and it's just much smaller and more intimate. I just totally vibe on that. But there are uh, some major league fan bases like that, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> if you yeah. up on a bean wagon. <laughs> <laughs> where, where it's like yeah. 1500 people show up to watch them play. Uh, I, I believe get, they're yeah. moving to Las Vegas. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so kind of getting back to uh, to Seton Hall and 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 neutral site courts, um, I I will say that I, you know, like you could hear even in the days leading up to the game that that you know Dennis knew what the gate was and he was not real happy about it because you know like they're gonna play on Friday night they're gonna play in St Louis and that building's gonna be full mm-hmm. uh, of you know, both sides are going to sell their, their full allotment of tickets. Uh, and so to, you know, to go to Kansas city, like he's basically saying, like, if we're going to do, if we're going to come here, like you guys need to buy tickets and to not have them buy tickets, like just play at home. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I don't think it's, you're, you're 100% right. I don't know that it's necessarily a Kansas city thing. I just, it's part, it's a symptom of the bigger problem here. Like if Mizzou tried to play Seton Hall in St. Louis and didn't have the Illinois game, it would probably be received about the same way. So it's, you know, it's a not, yeah. not a St. Louis, Kansas City thing. It's just like, I, you know, I, I get where he's coming from. I'm getting where the athletic department's coming well, from. Well, if Mizzou and Seton Hall played in, if Mizzou and Seton Hall played in Madison Square Garden, how many people would show up? Not many Mizzou fans. That's, no. that's a hike. <laughs> yeah, like not many. And so, like, I mean, how many Seton Hall fans are you expecting to travel to Kansas City? Yeah, it's, I get why they're doing it. I just don't agree with it personally. You know, I'm sure there's financial underlying reasons, but, you know, if you're, if you're having 7,500 people show up, I'm not sure what the real upside is there. Um, well, there's also like regional sports commissions <clears throat> that are involved, right? you know, right. that are, are working to get those kinds of games. Um. But yeah, I, I agree. Uh, but getting to the actual like basketball product, we've avoided um, it for twelve minutes, so it's time to get but, into it. <laughs> well, it, it's it's hard to talk about, uh, you know. Like I don't when you have a Jackson State loss on your resume, uh, this is not a game that you could really afford to lose. Like you needed to really kind of be strong uh, in this last three. Um, and you, you know, like no one's going to blame you for losing in Fog Allen Arena. Um, certainly, so far, Seton Hall has not uh, given themselves a whole lot of runway uh, <laughs> to, to make the NCAA tournament. And it's almost like in the post game, like, you know, Dennis Gates was calling Seton Hall a tournament team. And it's like, well, I mean, technically, they've been to the NCAA tournament in the past, <laughs> they're not going this year. Um, I mean, they, they might, like they might, if, if they shoot the ball, like they shot against Missouri, like, you know, you, you get enough wins the big East, then you're probably going to be a tournament team. But what's the likelihood of that happening? And I think that's probably the most disappointing thing for me is, uh, the exact kind of game that Missouri really couldn't have Seton Hall play. Like, so that's how Seton Hall played. They shot the ball up on the outside. They were able to get the ball into the rim, uh, and they converted at the rim and, uh, you give up, you know, 90 plus points to a pretty mediocre mm-hmm. offense. Uh, it, it makes it really, really difficult to win. And, uh, you know, even even last year's Missouri team would have had a hard time scoring enough points to beat Seton Hall the way that they were playing. Uh, and certainly this year's team, like they, you know, they streaked a little bit down the stretch, but it just it wasn't even close to being enough. Yeah, I had actually uh, been toying around with the idea of writing about Mizzou's defense prior to Sunday and how it had improved and some of the underlying metrics that were indicative of that it was going to be sustainable as they move forward. And then Sunday, whew, it was, I mean, 
<clears throat> credit to Seton Hall. They they made shots they don't typically make. They also made shots they don't typically make that were contested, but they were 18 of 22 at the rim. 18 of 22. Mizzou was 19 of 23, I believe, at the free throw line, uh, which a really good free throw shooting team shouldn't be shooting the same percentage as the opponent is at the rim. I mean, it's it, it was mind-boggling at just at how what we had seen so far. There there were little bits and pieces where Mizzou's defense struggled, notably in the I believe it was the first half against South Carolina State when they were just getting cut up and had to go to zone because they were not getting any stops whatsoever, and that was that was bad. But they they turned it around and. For the most part since then, and several good examples of how they were performing well, um, you know, you thought maybe that that was the thing in the past. But, man, Sunday it was every way you could get beat defensively, Mizzou got beat. It was just start to finish. And the only reason why I think it maybe wasn't worse is because Mizzou started really hauling out for a full-on press trying to get in the – trying to get back in the game. Seton Hall had a turnover or two and missed a couple free throws. Otherwise, I would have no doubt that if Mizzou was playing straight up, that Seton Hall would push past 100 points. And it was a 70-possession game. It was just, you know, there was nothing the Tigers could do that would, were slowing down Seton Hall. And that was by far the most disappointing aspect of the game. Yeah, there. I mean, I thought they opened... Uh, they opened decently enough. You know, I thought, it, uh, the, I think this happens a lot where teams kind of come out and um, and make a few shots maybe they don't normally make. Um, you know, just sort of the adrenaline of the opening tip. And I feel like both teams kind of were doing that. They were, you know, some trading some uh, some early baskets. But the way that Missouri came out, I was like, all right, like I'm, I'm really kind of like, I like the way that they're they're playing. Like they're kind of giving up a few open looks, but um, you you really don't expect Seton Hall to continue to like connect on all those. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like uh, was it Dylan Ade Wasu um, was four of six from deep. I mean, that guy shoots to the side. You know, like. His yeah. whole body is cocked to one side. He kind of shoots like this, and and you don't expect that guy to have a good night shooting most of the time, and and yet he he made that many. And really, it was just him and and Alamir Dawes, who I feel like should be on the scouting report as a guy who can hurt you from deep if he kind of <laughs> gets going, because he's been that guy in the past. I mean, like yeah. Nick Honor played with him at Clemson. He should know he should know his game pretty well. Um, you know, he's still a guy, he, he got up 11, three point attempts. Um, it's just like a really kind of disappointing performance at a time where, you know, it's like I said, like you can't really afford to, to drop that game. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm never the kind of guy who likes to write teams off, you know, before you hit conference play. Um, if you can put things together in conference play and, and make a run. Uh, you can do a lot, but I mean, Vanderbilt won 11 games in, in the SEC last year and got left out. And I don't know that Missouri has done enough, even if you beat Illinois, to go 11 and seven and still think that you can be an NCAA tournament team. Yeah, I mean, it's so much can happen between now and then, and you know, I would I would guess if they hit 20 wins in the regular season, they're going to be pretty close. Um, you know, looking at this year in, year out, the the bubble teams are, <laughs> you were just, the looking, bubble's always bad. You're looking for reasons to put a team in, you know, there's all of those teams have tons of reasons why they shouldn't be in. You're looking for one thing to latch on to, to put them in. So with that in mind, <clears throat> you know, I, we were discussing this, Matt Harris and the, Sam and I were discussing that a couple weeks ago that the Jackson State loss was very bad. It it's very damaging to your resume. There's nothing you can do about it now except win games. And the the thing that I was more concerned with was how they were playing. You know, and the last few weeks when they beat um, 
when they beat uh, Wichita State, they beat Pittsburgh, and they even played competitive at Kansas, you're looking at this team and saying, okay, you know, they whether they get there or not, they're on the right trajectory. Well, <laughs> bring in last Sunday, and that kind of gets called into question again. Um, you know, so it's it's kind of one step forward, two steps back. As that's kind of how the non-conference has gone. And, uh, you know, there's plenty of opportunities to turn around. You know, there's nothing preventing the zoo from going 20 and 0 the rest of the way, whether that's likely, mostly, most likely not. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, there's just so much that can happen between now and then with injuries, teams getting hot, teams going cold that I don't really like to, <clears throat> excuse me, that I don't really like to guess too much at this point, but stating where Mizzou is now, they've they've not done themselves many favors, despite having a couple of decent wins. Well, if you want to be the optimist, um, yeah, the SEC has been largely disappointing. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that includes a lot of teams that I think a lot of people thought were going to be, um, you know, like Final Four level contenders. I mean, Arkansas has slipped to 54th in Kim Palm. Uh, Kentucky's Slipped a little bit to 21st. Um, You know, Alabama can score the ball. um, Mm -hmm. But, yeah, their biggest issue has been, you know, on the defensive end. Auburn surprised me. Um, They played better than I thought they'd be. But, they, yeah, they've still got a couple um, not great losses on their their schedule. Or I guess Baylor's not a terrible loss. But uh, Appalachian State isn't great. Um, You know, Florida's barely in the top 40. South Carolina's. The hair under 70. Uh, Vanderbilt's turned out to be way worse than anybody thought. And Texas A&M has even struggled some. So, you know, it's it doesn't seem to me like there's a whole lot of... Um, I don't know. There, there, it does, like a, just a, a plethora of like deep, talented teams in the SEC that just scare you and think that you can't beat them. Yeah. Um, you know, so, you know, if you do want to play the optimist, there there are opportunities. I just don't know, you know, as I always try to be the realist, like, I just don't know how you look at this team and the way that they played the consistency uh, that they haven't found yet uh, and, and think that they can kind of go on that kind of run. Um, I mean, I could see them, you know, getting to nine or ten wins, um, you know, but but getting to 11 or, or, or you know, probably 12 would be required to get yourself back in, in the tournament race. Uh, I will say stopping short of, you know, like if they show up on Friday and beat the tar out of Illinois, then obviously like maybe you start to feel a little differently, but um, let's talk about Illinois. Okay. Uh, because this is a winnable game. Um the things that Illinois are good at can scare you because they can score the ball, uh, they shoot the ball well, and they don't really have a point guard, though. And as we saw last year, uh, and Missouri is a different team than they were last year, mm-hmm. but uh, one of the things that they, they do try to do is, is, is speed teams up, and if you speed Illinois up... Um, you know, they can turn the ball over. And I think that's kind of what, like what your, your hope has to be is they, you know, you kind of speed them up again, you get ahead and you make, make them play catch up. Uh, they've been really good defensively. Uh, mm-hmm. and with good reason, I mean, like their, their lineup is, is deep and big. Uh, and you know, it's almost like where the, not having a point guard helps them because, your starting point guard is really like a a, a wing, uh, and so you start wing 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 uh, combo forward center, and that's a that's a lot of size. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean they're they're a good team, and uh, <clears throat> you know I haven't dug into them a whole lot as we sit here, but I have watched them a couple times, and you know Taryn Shannon's a very good player. I've always been a um, Oh, I've always been intrigued with Coleman Hawkins. Um, you know, he's he's a unique player. He's what six ten, can step out, stretch the floor. He can guard multiple positions defensively. They're 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 a very good team. Um, 
you know, it, it's just when you look at bragging rights, it's <clears throat> none of it matters. <laughs> you know, the, I was just looking at this last night. Um, I'm not into sports betting, but out of the last six bragging rights games, the underdog has won four times outright. Um, you know, it's just who knows what's Thanks, gonna Javon Pickett. <laughs> <laughs> Javon Pickett and Kobe Brown. You know, there's been there's guys that not Kobe necessarily, but there's guys that step up in that game that don't traditionally do it. Um, you know, the environment in in uh what is it now? The Enterprise Center <laughs> is uh pretty unique. You know, it's I believe it's the Enterprise Center now. It used to I be think Santa so, Santa yeah. Tree, Keel Center. I, yeah, I'm uh, Keel. <clears throat> if you're if you're a, a true blooded St. Louis, and it's always Keel, I think. <laughs> but the Keel environment's just unique. You know, it's it, it is a true neutral site game in that you're going to have a ton of Illinois fans there. You're going to have a ton of Mizzou fans there, and it's just nonstop cheering. You know, no matter who's winning the game the building is loud. And if you're not used to that environment, if you've not played in that environment, it can be a little different, you know, it can be a, can be a little uh, intimidating. Um, So it's, it's just weird how different teams react in that game. Um, The last two games haven't been close. Mizzou won by, what was it? 22 last year. And I believe Illinois by 25 the year before, and neither of the games were that close. Um, so it's, you know, it's just, you don't really know what's going to happen and you can look at the matchups and we of course will, but that game more than any other, I just don't think it matters as much <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, it's simply a matter of who comes out and makes shots, you know, and whoever gets that building going in their favor is going to often is going to roll to a victory. And it doesn't always happen in the first half, but usually you get a pretty good feel for who's coming to play. Well, so the Illini, um, <laughs> so Terrence Shannon is currently fourth in, uh, in Ken Palm's MVP metric, um, on the, uh, on the season so far, he is behind, uh, PJ Hall, uh, Kyle Filipowski and, uh, a, a little guy from Purdue named Zach Eady. Uh, so. <laughs> Basically, there's like a player of the year rating that Kim Pom kind of gives everybody, and and Shannon Shannon has been that good. Uh, he's been he's, he's been very awesome. good. Uh, a, a guy who sort of stepped up and and willed them to that sort of win over uh, Florida Atlantic, which was a nice win, and uh, I believe Madison Square Garden. Uh, Marcus Domask, who is a mm-hmm. Southern Illinois transfer. Uh, he has not shot the ball well from outside to date, uh, but he is really good in the mid range. He's a crafty uh, scorer. He's he's physical. Um, you know, get to his spots. Uh, and and Coleman Hawkins uh, is a guy who also has not shot the ball well this year. Uh, basically, Illinois has Shannon, who's shooting forty one percent from deep. Luke Goody, who is shooting forty six percent from deep. And then nobody else on the team is shooting anything worth a lick. I guess, you know, Justin Harmon's five of 14. Uh, so he's not attempting, you know, many threes. That's uh, just under 36%. Um, everybody else is, is kind of struggling to shoot, uh, but they're not a team that uh, that looks to do a whole lot more than what they're good at. Uh, Terrence Shannon has sort of free reign to get to the cup as much as he can. You know, Goody does like to, sh- to stretch the floor and, and that's pretty much what he is, is a spot up guy. Uh, and, and they get to Domask in the mid range and Hawkins to make plays and Quincy Garrier, who's, uh, is an Oregon transfer by, uh, Syracuse started at Syracuse and went to mm-hmm. Oregon and, and right. now he's finishing up at Illinois. Um, he's been kind of like a nice vers- versatile defender for them. Um, you know, like they really do not have anyone to handle the ball. They kind of approach it as a by committee thing. You know, uh, they're more than happy to just sort of, uh, you know, back people up the floor a little bit uh, and and try to get into their sets that way. 
Uh, you know, but they're still a, an efficient offense. Um, you know, basically because it's Shannon, it's Goody from deep, it's Dovask in the mid range, and, and like these guys aren't really doing anything that they're not supposed to be doing. The key for Missouri is is you know can they get the non ball handlers to cough up the ball, um, and realistically, uh, you know for for. for all of the things that they were good at defensively last year, um, we kind of thought this team would be better defensively, and they have been. Um, but they're not really forcing a whole lot of turnovers. Like, I mean, even <clears throat> against you know Seton Hall, I, I want to say it was. I'll pull it up so I'm, you know, not talking out of my ass completely. Um, they forced fifteen. Um, most of those were in the last quarter of the game. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so when, you know, when the other team is, is you know, calmed down and taking care of the ball, like Missouri has not been able to kind of, you know, get out and generate, you know, the kind of, uh, the kind of runs that they were last year. Uh, and so like their, their pace is, is also dragged down a bit. And I just don't think, I don't, I don't think like we're seeing uh, kind of a lot of what this team, I think we were kind of thinking they were going to be, especially when they're getting as deep into the bench as, as, uh, as they are. They just don't, they don't speed teams up. I have a wry smile because I, here's a plug. I I wrote about all of this and it's dropping tomorrow. By the time you get this into your ears, it will be on the site. Uh, I believe it's scheduled to run at like eight o'clock tomorrow morning. And I had uh, just been looking over all this, and you're you're spot on on all of it. It's considered an early early Christmas gift from the Grinch. It's not it's not a <laughs> it's not a rosy picture, but it's uh, it's some important questions nonetheless. But yes, you're exactly right. You know, it, Mizzou, I believe, rates 45th nationally, and turning teams over, which is good. I mean, that's that's a very healthy number at 21% of possessions. Um, when you look at where they were last year at this point in time, at this point in time, they were 26.4, which was second best nationally. You know, and you, you may think, well, you know, that's 40 spots, whatever. That's, that's not that big of a deal. Just the math there, that's 5% of possessions. And in a game of 70, that's about three and a half extra possessions they're forcing turnovers on. Yeah. If you consider uh, each possession worth the other, points, you know, that's three or four points a game right there. So. Yeah. I was, I mean, that's one of the reasons why in study hall, like I, I have like the total possessions and then I have, you know, the possessions minus turnovers. Um, I just think like it's, it's, it's a healthy kind of look. And one of the things that Missouri always did last year and did really well was, basically have more shot attempts um you know because they knew they were going to give up offensive rebounds uh but they had they had more possessions uh minus turnovers than than their opponent almost every game um and that's how they were able to kind of you know balance it this year we just don't don't quite see the same uh effectiveness i guess is is the you know the way to you know to their press and um i i mean if if they don't get illinois to turn the ball over i don't see how they're going to beat them right no i i would agree with that and mizzou will turn illinois over it's just a matter of how much um yeah is that 20 eight to 30 percent versus you know 21 percent. if it's 21 percent, i don't no, that's enough. Like they, they need to really kind of get into them. What were, what was their turnover rate last year? In that particular game? I do not know it. Uh, I'm sure it was somewhat high, but again, in that game is who's just blowing their doors off on offense. Um, you know, not missing shots, getting everything they wanted. Um, but all well, Coleman you know, Hawkins had six turnovers on his own. <laughs> not a good sign. <laughs> I, I, and I think that like that's one of the things because he when uh when Sky Clark struggled, which early in the season Sky Clark struggled a lot, um 
you know, even with like Epps and Harris on the floor, like they didn't really, because both those guys are a little bit more like combo guardy than they are point guardy. Um, like they, they turned to Colin Hawkins as a primary ball handler and Missouri's like, cool, we're going to put Kobe Brown on you <laughs> and he can, he can defend. And, and sure enough, like, you know, like Hawkins just coughed the ball up left and right. Uh, you know, as soon as he was catching the ball in the backcourt and I, you know, I think that that kind of led to a lot of the momentum that Missouri had. Um, is there a, is there a mark that you think that they need to get to turnover rate wise to, in order to kind of, you know, be competitive and, and possibly win? You know, it's, it's such a hard question to answer. Um, they were 24.6% last year. I mean, if Mizzou did that again this year, they would, that would be good. Um, but I just, you know, from, from game in, game out, and especially in this particular game with this environment, this matchup, I just don't know what to expect. You know, it's, does Mizzou come out, shoot the ball well, defend as well as they have in the past? You know, if they do those things, they don't need an incredibly high turnover rate to win. But realistically, I mean, yeah, you're looking at, a quarter possessions, you know, if you're doing that, I think Mizzou has a shot. Um, assuming other things are going well, you know, if they're giving up uncontested layups on the other 75%, then it really isn't going to matter a whole lot. Um, but yeah, I, it, it's going to be a major, major point of the game, I think. Well, so according to Ken Palm, uh, there is no line out yet. Uh, it is a projected 10 point loss. That is a significant uh, difference. Um, 79-69 is the projected score. Uh, after that, Missouri uh, takes a week off and comes back home to play Central Arkansas, who's currently 335th in Kempom before they open SEC play uh, the next week. So we really don't have a whole lot of basketball happening over the next few weeks. Um we have Illinois Friday, the following Saturday, Central Arkansas, the following Saturday, Georgia, uh, and then they make a road trip to Rupp Arena. Um, so hopefully things are going well for Missouri football or continue to go well, uh, <laughs> I guess, because um, honestly, like it's, it's difficult because they played on the ninth, they lost. It was disappointing. They played again on the 17th and lost, and now they're going to play on the 22nd. And then you have a whole other week before you play basketball again. Uh, and, you know, very clearly they should beat Central Arkansas. Obviously, uh, you know, the Jackson State loss is disappointing. Jackson State is 255 in Kempom. Um, some of that was aided by Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, but 335 is much worse. Um, but Central Arkansas still had that guy that, like, went into the transfer portal, and I think he went back. <laughs> Um, I'm going to guess yes, just because that doesn't sound surprising in 2023. Well, I, I think there was a guy, I, I want to say it was Central Arkansas. I don't recognize any names, so maybe he got hurt or something. Um, there was a guy who, and he was he listed, like, he went on a visit to Arkansas. He listed Missouri in, like, his top three with, like, Butler. And then committed to was, Butler. Uh... Was that? I don't remember. But, I mean, <laughs> we're talking nine months ago. In yeah. Arkansas. I know there was a there Cameron was a, Hunter. Yeah, that That's sounds it. familiar. Yeah, Cameron Hunter. Yeah, he hasn't played yet this year. Huh. Maybe he has to sit out because of transfer. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I don't. I don't see his name in any uh, on the Kempom page. Um. But yeah, so kind of going back to my point, uh, not a lot of basketball to play over you know the next you know the last couple weeks and into the next couple weeks. Um, yeah, there's a possibility of going through this you know this four game stretch before conference play, thinking that you could possibly get to um, you know just go two and two or possibly you know three and one, and then you're feeling really good of making up for that Jackson State loss. Um, it comes down to bragging rights now as, as the only sort of win out of those three uh, and then Central Arkansas. So um, 
I don't know. Like I'm, I'm ready for bragging rights. I'm really curious how it's going to go. Uh, I like, I don't want to sound negative. Like I'm still, I'm still very positive over the Dennis Gates era. I just kind of, it, this feels like it's gotten a little bit away from them. I, I yeah, don't like I what agree. they're doing rotationally. Like, you know, <clears throat> like not having, uh, you know, Caleb grill who I think had sort of figured out his role right before he got hurt. Um, yeah, like it's, you know, John Tanji just, he was minus 16. Yeah. Against Seton Hall. Like, I mean, it, it, if, right. if Dennis Gates doesn't play John Tanji, does Missouri win that game? <laughs> I mean, probably not. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know how many minutes he played. I know it wasn't many, but, uh, and I don't think he played any in the like in the second half. He, there, like I, I feel like he, he just wasn't very good. And yeah, I don't, I don't know that I, know I have a whole lot else. I know he didn't play uh, late when they were coming back, so he didn't get the benefit of that uh, that run under his belt. Uh, you know, but it, you're right. It, this year, I wouldn't say had great expectations. I I remember we talked in one of the podcasts earlier about the whether it was a direct quote or a general feeling about final fours and whatnot and I was like, eh, let's let's kind of pull back a little bit you know i think this team has the capability to be good but we need to see how it all comes together because i mean yeah last year i was i was a pretty big believer in mizzou being a quality team coming into the season i think i might have been at least among the non-rock m mizzou faithful um, might have been seen as a little bit of an optimist in that. And, you know, had you told me that Isaiah Mosley would have went down or not went down, just went out early in the year, um, <clears throat> I probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have been as optimistic. But you know what? The, that team meshed really well. They did things much better than I could have ever expected. And they had a great year. Um, so it, you just don't know until you see it. And even after you see it, you don't know until you see it multiple times. And, you know, we're 11 games in the season now, so we've seen it and we kind of know what we're dealing with at this point. And I don't think John Tanja is going to morph into an all-conference player all of a sudden. I think he's a very talented player. I think he has he would help this team if he was whatever <clears throat> lingering issues from his foot injury and his reacclimation to the lineup, whatever is preventing him from doing that. If you took that away, I I think he helps. I think he definitely helps. I think Caleb Grill helps. Um, but at this point, you can't really count on them to be those guys that you expected them to be um, <clears throat> for various reasons. So, you know, it's it's a little disappointing um, between the, especially the Jackson State game and um, last Sunday when they frankly no-showed for about <clears throat> 20, 25 minutes of the game. So, you know, I understand why there's some trepidation going into bragging rights and heading into the conference schedule, but, you know, you just don't know. I, I think there is a distinct divide between the non-conference schedule and the regular season, the conference regular season. And, you know, some coaches can get their players and get their teams to buy in, like, wipe all that away. It's a new season. You can go win a championship and we're starting even with everyone. Some teams respond to that. I think... Texas A&M respond to that, who had as bad or worse of a non-conference schedule or non-conference uh, record than Mizzou did. Um, so you just don't know. <laughs> you know, but I don't think that is anything that's going to really lift anyone's spirits, the unknown. Uh, but that's where I stand at this point. Well, and I, I feel like there's a, a like a sense of disappointment you know, with the team so far this year and, and not just like, you know, you and me and, and Matt Harris, who obviously talk a lot, uh, you know, but just seeing comments online and, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and just the, the sort of general enthusiasm, uh, you know, around posts about basketball seems to be like down a little bit. Um, and I don't necessarily think that that's, but like I think it's reflective of a couple things. Uh, one, the football team having a absolute standout season. Um, you know, very clearly, like 
as the guy who's been running the site now for several years, like I, I know which side of the bread is buttered. Um, you know, football is always number one in the United States. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's fine. Um, so I, I think if anything, like it's allowed, you know, Missouri basketball and some of their struggles, um, to fly under the radar a little bit. I think fans are still very excited about Dennis Gates. I think fans mm-hmm. are really excited about the recruiting. And there now seems to be a sense of like, well, okay, maybe the season isn't going to be as, as fun as last year, but we have good recruits. We have a coach we like, you know, that's enough for, for me to just sort of be like, all right, like this doesn't have to be a great season. Um, I still contend that, as somebody who is a passionate basketball fan, like I just want to see this team get better. Um, Agreed. And like, I want to see them do the things that they aren't doing very well. I want to see them do better. I want the the scouts to come out looking better. I want the team to look, you know, more and more prepared with each week. Um, Cause I think like, that's also part of my disappointment so far this year is, is I don't, I don't know outside of, you know, really the three week stretch of uh or three game stretch of of Pitt, Wichita State and and Kansas where I felt like the team was prepared. Mm-hmm. Um like I, I was really encouraged by how they played at Kansas because they were not intimidated by the environment. Right. And I liked that. And then they just come out and they looked like the same team that struggled against Loyola and South Carolina State and, and Jackson State. Um yeah, yeah. And I, I just want to see less of that and more of like Pitt and Kansas. Yeah, I found it kind of interesting that um, at least so far that Mizzou is, in my opinion, played some of their best games on the road. Granted, they found themselves down 19 against Minnesota, which is exactly a spot you want to be. Um, but they did rally very well. They tried to do it again this <clears throat> this past Sunday and couldn't quite pull it off. But I mean, between that Pittsburgh and, you know, even the game at Kansas, it's like, I would probably consider that their third or fourth best performance of the year. They lost. They didn't shoot well. Well, I shouldn't say they didn't shoot well. They didn't score well. Part of my critique was that they, they shot the ball plenty well from outside. They just didn't shoot enough, um, but they didn't score enough. We'll put it that way. Seven to three sixty four. They defended reasonably well. It took Bill Self multiple adjustments with his game plan to get the shots um, that they needed to win. And we mused while watching the Indiana game that they were missing just hordes of ten footers against the Hoosiers, but they made virtually all of them against Mizzou. Um, you know, but that's going to happen. It not faulting anyone for that. Um, but at least you saw Mizzou put the game to Kansas and Kansas have to respond as the better team at home and come out and change what they were initially trying to do to match what you were doing. And once they did that, they were able to execute just enough to pull away somewhat comfortably, you know, but (laughs) there was nothing that faltered or nothing that phased Seton Hall last weekend and that's probably the most disappointing aspect of it so anyway you know i i agree i think mizzou had been looking better and last weekend calls that into question but you know it's it's basketball my my high school coach was adamant that football is a passionate game basketball is not it's a maybe that's why i like it so much it's uh you know you got to move on to the next play there's no there's no time to um stomp your feet or get too high, get too low after a possession because you've got to go back and go to the, get to the other end of the floor. Um, and I kind of look at that from game to game. It's a long season. There's 31 plus games that you're playing. And if you allow it to carry over from one to the next, you're beat. So, um, you know, we'll see how they respond this weekend. Who knows? A big win against Illinois could change a lot of things. If they come out and get a 20 piece Where drop down on it. It might not be so rosy for Christmas, but we'll see. That's why they play the games. Yeah, it's 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 weird how your opinion of the team changes game to game based <laughs> on what they did last. Uh, um, 
Yeah, so I think you and I are going to get out of here. Uh, we'll see what happens, Bragging Rights. Uh, I will be back next week, um, probably post-Christmas, to uh, talk about Bragging Rights and, uh, and, and, and preview the Central Arkansas Bears. I want to say it's the Bears. I think you're right. Um, not 100% sure. I'm not even sure what conference they play in, if I was being perfectly honest. <laughs> they're, they're they're purple um their colors are purple we need harris here for this he knows everything about arkansas mascots you know they i'm so not the they arkansas are <laughs> they are the bears they're based in conway arkansas uh and they're the a sun okay i would i would not have guessed that the a sun i didn't think they were in the swack but then again i don't know what else they would have been in so it's uh that's uh that's where i guess the swack or southland i should add both of those in there one of those two would have been my guess but, uh, well Watkins, if you are heading down to brag and rights which is I this friday uh i would encourage you to swing by the central west end uh there's a little restaurant there called sunday's best uh, I've heard good news. It is, uh, it's a kind of a cool little spot. He, uh, they're doing $2 pints of uh, Yingling Flight and the traditional lager. Um, I'm not a huge Yingling fan, but I know a lot of people are. Uh, <laughs> so you can go down there and 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 get a cheap beer before the game. Uh, I, I promise you, if you order the chicken, you will not be disappointed. The chicken is fantastic. Uh Definitely dead, head down there. If you're a Missouri fan or an Illinois fan, you can stop by and, and have some delicious food at Sunday's Best. Um, you know, mention to the owner that that you're a Mizzou fan. Uh, I'm assuming you are if you're listening to this. Uh, and he'll he'll talk your ear off about how excited he is about Eli Drinkwitz and all the recruits. Um, so with that said, uh, definitely head down there. And we will be back next week with more of this uh this podcast also head over to um five seven three t's i'm just gonna get all the ads out of the way here at the end uh i'm gonna put the link up on on here here five seven three t's.com slash collections slash rock dash m we have a cotton bowl t-shirt uh that you can you can pick up and uh and like i said all those proceeds that we're getting um are going to nil uh, I think we may take a little bit and because we are sending some guys to the Cotton Bowl game, we might reimburse some of their, their travel expenses. But most of it's going to NIL. Um, so buy yourself a t-shirt. There's also the Tennessee State Champ still available. Uh, so we'll be back next week. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Rock M Radio, a proud partner of Fans First Sports Network. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to see more, just like it beamed directly into your personal device, just click the subscribe button below uh, and you can find this podcast through the Apple podcast app or for iPhone or the Google podcast app for Android or whatever app you use to listen to your podcast. Uh, we are also available on Spotify to search for rock M radio. Uh, and if you like other sports fans for sports network uh, is a podcast network that has a uh, coverage of all other teams, major league baseball, uh, MLS, uh, NFL, Whatever you want uh, to listen and, and read about, it is a great, great network full of really fantastic podcasts. So look them up and subscribe uh, to any and all of those podcasts. Uh, Rock M Radio will be back with more episodes coming soon. Thanks. Thanks.